the best data engineers that he knows are people who were previously data analysts because they have this understanding of what the downstream user of these data pipelines is going to be interested in. The model is learned, is trained, and you, the data is coming in maybe as a stream, and then you apply the new data to your, to your model and that creates outputs, which go somewhere. From a, from a standpoint where you look at data science from the outside, it always seems like machine learning and the algorithms and stuff, that's the only thing that you need. Andreas, willkommen. Welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. It's an honor to have you here. Where in the world are you calling in from? Hi, John. Uh, I'm calling from Germany, from northern Bavaria, where I live with my family, wife, and the two kids nice. in a small town. Yeah, we had, uh, uh, leading up to recording with you, uh, we almost had this amazing coincidence that I was going to be in Bavaria and able to record with you in person. Uh, but we just, we narrowly, the time that I'm there, you're not available for recording. And so we're doing a remote session as usual. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I haven't even, I haven't traveled off of North America since the pandemic started. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, these incredibly unlikely odds, but and it didn't work out anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what it is sometimes. Well, I love that part of the world. I've, I've visited Bavaria many times and yeah, I love the food. I love the beer. I love the mountains. <laughs> uh, yeah. I've ne I haven't yet bought a pair of Lederhosen. Do you have a pair of Lederhosen? Uh, I actually don't. <laughs> I, I actually don't. <laughs> I had one uh, pair for going to the... To Oktoberfest. No, well, I ha or, no, not Oktoberfest, but we have the smaller... Fest here in, in our area. Mm, September one. Fest. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the quiet run up to Oktoberfest. Yeah, I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, nice. So we know each other through Kate Strashny, who has been on the show many times. Most recently, she did an episode number 651, which aired earlier this year. And she's become a friend of mine uh, initially through having her on the show, but I see her in person at conferences and sometimes in New York. And I understand that you've known her for a while as well. Yeah. Uh, Kate, I know Kate for, I don't know, four or five years. We actually uh, got to know each other through a group when we uh, did a YouTube um, channel that was called uh, Data Science Office Hours. Hmm. And it right. was just like people on LinkedIn. At that time, LinkedIn wasn't that big and it was there were a few influencers there. That was one of the small ones. And like we met there, Kate wasn't a data scientist. I wasn't a data scientist, but we had fun. And at some point that then ended and, and we stayed in touch. And I actually, I'm usually meeting her Monday, my three o'clock. And then we, oh, we really? talk about you guys meet business. Weekly. Yeah. We have a weekly for, for wow. a long time. And yeah, oh it's, my it's goodness. Really fun, so. Wow. That's so cool. I had no idea. That is, I mean, that is a close relationship. There are not that many people I have weekly calls with. I like, yeah. you know, I feel the people that I do, I feel extremely close to. Wow. I think we never missed one since, since we started. This. <laughs> like it's, I, I don't it always works out and it's, wow. yeah, it's really nice. And it makes sense to me that you two would both complement like a data science office hours because you have expertise on the like edge of data science. Mm. So for her data visualization, I mean, this is, I mean, data visualization, this is a data presentation is absolutely critical to being a great data scientist. Um, but it, I guess it isn't like a core skill, like scikit-learn or something. I don't know. Yeah. It should be a core skill. Yeah, it should be a core skill because I think most of engineers and most of scientists need to present stuff and mm -hmm. do slides and stuff. So yeah. it's yep. visualization is a great, is, is very important get buy-in oh. it's important um and then you sit on the edge of it as a data engineer expert mm. and data engineering as we're going to talk about a lot in this episode is critical <laughs> uh increasingly more and more um for data scientists to have these skills and we'll get into why shortly so you teach data engineering to thousands of students through your learn data engineering academy and then your youtube channel 
has tens of thousands more people on it as well. And there's a Discord channel as well, a Discord server, sorry. <laughs> I'm not that big into Discord, so I sometimes get the jargon wrong. Um, so why is data engineering worth teaching and worth learning, maybe particularly if you're a data scientist? Yeah. The thing is, and I get that I'll ask a lot because from a from a standpoint where you look at data science from the outside, it always seems like machine learning and like all the algorithms and stuff, that's the only thing that you need. But actually, when you talk to a lot of scientists, they need to do also the engineering. They not only analyze the data, they need to come up with some kind of automation for processing the data that leads up to the actual doing the science or, or automating the science, which is not perfect. Uh, I think for me is always when I, the scientists I know, I think they're brilliant scientists, but they're, they're, the engineering is not their expertise. And so for a proof of concept that it's very important, especially for a data scientist, but at some point then you need, you need engineers who take over and basically, yeah. A way that I often think about data engineering is, and I would love to be corrected on this by you or get your opinion on this, but a way that I often describe it is it, it allows data scientists to be getting refined data. So we have very, very large amounts of data being stored, uh, more data than ever being recorded every kind of 18 to 24 months, the amount of data being recorded at any given time point, it doubles. So this crazy exponential amount of data, but the data are often unstructured or so vast that uh, it's difficult to work with, or there could be a lot of noise amongst valuable data. And so I think of data engineers as being able to work with very large amounts of data and process it, maybe clean it, structure it, so that it can be often in a tabular format, uh, you know, well-labeled columns, mm -hmm. Um, and maybe a smaller amount of the data, data that have been selected from the vast amount of data that, uh, you know, we think based on the model that we're trying to develop, um, you know, these particular rows are more likely to be valuable to the model. So we're creating from potentially large, very vast amounts of unstructured data or very large amounts of structured data, we're getting down to uh, well-defined columns um, that maybe have been cleaned up, and the rows are cases that we believe will have um, a large amount of value to the data science model that we're training. What do you think about that yeah. explanation? Well, it's yeah, that's that's a, that's basically the essence. I, I think you hit a lot of really good points. To explain this whole what data engineering is about, I think it's or how I usually explain this is you need to look at it from a journey that goes from. Uh, from left to right, and on the left is where your data sources are. That might be an API that you have from another system or a database or a data source that is sending you data in large amounts. And on the right side is where your data scientist or your data analyst is. And somehow you need to now connect the the scientist, the analyst with the data that is coming in. What everything that happens in between, that's that's a lot what you mentioned. That is right. making sure the data is is clean, making sure the processes run uninterrupted, making sure it everything scales, transforming the data. It's coming in as a, in a, as a JSON format, for instance, and then you take it and you make sure everything is right, and then you put it into a destination in a tabular form or something. Right, right. And, and I that, guess... that, is, that is a large part of what, a, what an engineer needs to do. And for me, that's also, uh, as I said, that's where a data scientist can learn a lot because if there is no engineer, then the data scientist must usually take that place and, and start doing that. Right, exactly. So in smaller organizations, the data scientists have to learn some data engineering skills in order to be uh, 
creating the data for themselves. Uh, you know, this kind of structured data. I guess another kind of application area. Um, so you mentioned that the data engineer could be preparing data for a data analyst or a data scientist. I suppose another application area could be for automated dashboards even. So it isn't necessarily going to some to an analyst to be uh, creating bespoke charts with bespoke analysis or a data scientist to be creating a model with, but in addition, a data engineer could be preparing data to flow fully automatically into some dashboards or reports that non-technical people will be viewing. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. It could also be that um, you're working on a transactional system, right? Where the where actually the end customer, think about Amazon, you have somebody makes a transaction and then something happens within Amazon and processes are getting started and then the updates need to get somehow again into the front end so the, the user can actually access the data. And this most likely is not going to stay within one database. It's a larger process and multiple systems are, are you're included and to actually then get that into the transactional database or, or database in the end that's that's where the engineers need to do a lot of stuff business intelligence tools are too complicated and take too much time to manage and your team then still ends up frustrated that they don't have access to data it's 2023 people and it's time to rethink business intelligence Lean.io is the lightweight visualization tool that lets you define your metrics just once and then empowers everyone in your organization to explore your data visually. In episode number 653, we caught up with Carlos, the founder of Glean.io and the super technical entrepreneur, detailed how he's built a platform to democratize data analytics. Sign up and get started for three months free at Glean.io when you tell them you heard about Glean from the Super Data Science Podcast. Nice. So within the field of data engineering, surely there are kinds of entry level data engineers, junior data engineers, senior data engineers. How do the, like, what kinds of competencies do these various levels have? Uh, yeah, what's the mm -hmm. difference between entry level and, and senior data engineering? For juniors, we have to think of juniors, you are most likely very limited on what you can do and what overview you have of, of all the tools that are required and like the experience of working with them. So usually juniors, you most you come in and you have a few specific or a few core tools that you are working with and that your the jobs that you're doing are very narrow. Like, okay, we have this bigger project. Now you as a junior come in and you take the first transformation step and you do this, and then the next one, somebody else does the other stuff. And so as junior, you're most likely very limited in, in what you're doing from the whole pipeline. And as you progress then to having more experience, knowing more tools, um, being more hands-on with the actual data that is coming in, that's where you then make that transition into a associate or full, full professional role. Right, where you have, where you maybe have a full pipeline that you that you manage, or multiple ones, where you are doing more of the of the conceptual phase of everything. Mm -hmm. That you okay, we have a new, we have a project. This needs to be done. The data looks like this in the beginning. This is at the end. How can you model the data? Or, or you don't even know the how it look how it's going to look at the end. Then the the professional is going to know. Okay, this we're going to model it in that way and put it there where the junior usually can't do that right right you you still need to learn and it's 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 good if you have somebody who is actually uh or who has experience and can can learn so i guess it's similar to almost any kind of role where these senior people are able to take a an abstract problem or something that's described to them by a data scientist or management or something or maybe even identify proactively some kind of solution mm -hmm. and they can be architecting it and they know from their experience how to break this into different parts and roughly how long each part will take, what the complexity is, how to approach it. Um, whereas the junior data scientist is more getting handed those pieces of work and saying, 
okay, junior data engineer, here's your part of the problem for today. Let's see how you get on with that today and let me know tomorrow. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, the as you mentioned, the communication with other stakeholders in the whole process, that's where where the where the yeah, the professional then needs to do a lot of work. Yeah, the and more senior one. Yeah, the or the more senior one. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you look at the senior senior data engineer, that's usually where you then get into the role of okay, it's not just you. We have a team, you basically help the whole team work on your on your projects, work on your goals. Nice. So what kind of person <laughs> becomes a data engineer instead of, say, a data scientist or a data analyst? Are there, like, in your experience, are there innate skills or interests that make mm -hmm. somebody more likely to do this kind of data engineering role than other options in the field? I, I usually, I, there's a question I get asked often, like, should I become a data scientist or should I become a data engineer? And I think that fits very well to that question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I usually try to answer this pointing people towards what's your interest? Are you more interested in computer science coming from the software development side? Or are you more into analytics, statistics, the mathematical stuff? You know, then that then most likely then you're going to become a or want to become a scientist. If you're coming from the like I'm I'm coming from classical computer science background, and that's that's the that's usually the role that the engineer is working a lot with tools, a lot with configuration, uh, a lot of software development, and so that's that's where you want where you know which direction you should go and where. You, Okay, all right. Then here's a twist on that question. So if it's these kind of people with computer science backgrounds that make data engineers, it makes perfect sense to me. But then why choose, say, data engineering over machine learning engineering? Is there a difference between these two kind of people? Because both of those cases, they're, that's more like the computer science. So where the data engineer, and again, feel free to correct me if you don't think these definitions are appropriate, but um, in kinds of broad strokes, the data engineer can be working on the data pipelines to clean up the data and provide those to the data scientist. But then once the data scientist has created the model, then these model weights are passed off to the machine learning engineer to productionize them and make sure that they're performant in production. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. So, the, yeah, for this, and I, I did this, when was that? End of last year, I did this, uh, this sheet where I actually put in the roles like from junior to senior, and I also added machine learning engineer there. And how I how I said, or how I see this is, at some point you most likely are going to make that shift. So let's say you you are a professional data engineer, you have learned data engineer, you have some experience, then maybe you want to make that shift towards ML engineer or towards uh, architect, data architect or platform architect. Right, so it's that it's more of a specific. Is it called specification? No, it's like yeah, a specialization. A specialization, yeah. It's more a specialization, I think, than immediately going out wanting to become a, a, a ML engineer. That makes a lot of sense. Oh, that's a nice definition. All right, so back to data engineering proper. What kinds of tools should data engineers be using regularly? So. When you look at the at the pipeline of how the data is is going to be processed or where is it coming from, where is it going, a lot of stuff that a data engineer needs to know is uh, relational databases. That's I know it sounds very boring, man. These relational databases have been here <laughs> for thirty years, but when you look at where the data is coming from, very often it's still coming from relational databases. APIs is something that a, that an engineer needs to know and needs to get comfortable with because either you are going to use an API from an external source or you need to create an API to actually uh, serve the data internally that's for the source and the the basically the data ingestion sometimes people work a lot with in uh, data ingestion tools like uh, or ETL tools like uh, had talent or, or hevo or stuff 
or also tools on, on cloud platforms. Um, and then coming back, the processing frameworks, very often you find then something where you need to process then the data. Either this is something serverless, you find very often for simple jobs, you find something like on AWS Lambda functions, where you just create a small function and the data isn't that big that is coming in at once. So that's absolutely fine. Or if it's something bigger, where you have a framework that allows you to parallel process data, like Apache Spark, or you're going onto a platform like Databricks, uh, not yeah, Databricks, sorry, uh, where you can then actually leverage that. And at the end, Maybe a maybe a NoSQL database or a data warehouse depends on your your goal, but these are usually the categories. Is something data ingestion, maybe a streaming tool like Kafka, I don't know, or, or Kinesis. Then something for processing and for storage, and that's usually what you see. Nice. So relational databases, of course, and that's a, that means things like SQL. Yeah. 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 Well, um, I, I only I always say relational databases because people have. I, whenever I say SQL, people come back to me and say, "It's just a query language. That's not a database." Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. yeah it's okay. <laughs> I learned my lesson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, the the yeah, we're interacting often with the relational database using SQL. Um, so yeah, so that makes sense. Storing the data in relational databases, and this kind of goes back to the point that I was making near the beginning of this episode where uh, in ideally for a data scientist to be most easily able to work with data or to be creating data dashboards or a data analyst being able to work with the data, having the data structured into clear columns in this kind of relational database is key. And uh, yeah, we're, you know, like you're saying, I'll, you know. well, it, it necessarily doesn't need to be a relational database. When you look at the tools that are out there right now, like it, let's say you, you have your data and data is coming in as, as uh, JSON files, or as JSON, and then you put it into files, and you make these files bigger and bigger and bigger, and then you take a tool like Snowflake, and then basically turn these onto the platform into tables. So somebody who's coming in could actually work with SQL on top of unstructured, unstructured data or non-table tabular data. So that's that's what what you see a lot. Nice, excellent. Um, and so, yeah, so relational databases makes perfect sense to me. Obviously seems like a core skill in data engineering. Um, APIs, um, we can talk about that um, a little bit more for our listeners in mm -hmm. case they aren't aware of what they are. So uh, application programming interfaces, this is like a way of interacting with computers in the same way that a click and point user interface is. But with an mm -hmm. API, instead of it being like click and point in your browser, um, it's at the command line. And so you can make requests uh, to an API. So the, the API is kind of, it's often online and just kind of sitting there waiting for you to make some request. And then, so you provide a request to it in, very, in a very specific way and it can return some information to you. And it's interesting, you highlighted there for me something that I don't think about myself often enough which is that data engineers are often tasked uh, with creating these APIs for internal use. So um, APIs for external use, these have to have like a lot of documentation, be very robust. So for example, somebody might wanna take advantage of the GPT-3 model. And so they can go and use the OpenAI API to send some query to GPT-3, ask it to do some language task, and then the OpenAI API returns back to you the results of that task that you asked GPT-3 to perform. Mm -hmm. um, and so similarly, um, data engineers, like you mentioned, are often tasked with internally building these same kinds of uh, ways of interacting in the code so that the internal data analyst or data scientist or dashboard or whatever can, um, can write this standardized request to the data engineer's API and get back some result. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly what what happens a lot. The first case where using an external API is very convenient, but a lot of people know that, especially if you use Apple APIs. I've had a few students at work; they were 
requesting data from Apple APIs and Apple is just like, okay, we're changing this today. We're telling nobody that stuff changed. Oh, and then my goodness. you're <laughs> you're at the wrong end. But um yeah, sometimes you need to maybe some management tools, like just have a have a database for the data scientists for some model statistics or stuff, right? So they want to use that from their code. So let's spin up a database, let's build up a, a simple data model and sit it in front of an API so the data scientist does not need to work with files and stuff. So, but just the code is automatically then sending the the data via HTTP requests into your into your database. Right? And then right. on the other side, maybe a user interface sits and that uses other APIs to query that data again from that store and visualize it. So. Mm -hmm. You mentioned there how APIs can change on you, like the like the Apple API can change without uh, them giving you any notifications. So it's another part of the data engineer's job to have monitoring systems in place. Absolutely. That's one of the big things that you need to do and, and or that you also, why you need data engineering constantly. Because it's sometimes, it's, sometimes, people think this is just a one-time thing mm -hmm. you build that pipeline and then that's it especially it's perfect in management. forever yeah it's especially in management well 20 years ago you you had that software development and you built that software and then that's it right that was it it, it worked for you years you shipped the cd you <laughs> shipped the cd exactly and then that was it but nowadays a big big problem is actually that the data is going to change like i mentioned with the api but also it could be on the on the source within a relational database somebody does some model change and tells nobody and then you have another have pipelines that actually attach to that data and then something's going wrong you have no idea what has gone wrong and you need to start debugging and figuring out and for that you need the monitoring systems so monitoring metrics good good metrics and also stuff like Elasticsearch or something where you send in uh, send in errors and, and or errors or warnings send in the JSONs into Elasticsearch and then do some some research do do simple search queries and then get to that to that lock very quickly and that's so then so then the data engineer might have something like uh, like Slack notifications or something that comes up. Uh, if there's some kind of issues, yeah, could be some Slack, could be some, could be that you're firing off emails through. You create a, ah uh, oh man, how's it called on AWS? I think SNS, simple notification service, where once something critical is happening, you send that to the notification service, and that sends out a high priority email to a few people. And then could also be simple dashboards where you build dashboards. Mm -hmm and uh, look at the data and keep that on track. Nice. Recently in episode number 655, Keith McCormick and I discussed how to get a profitable return on an AI project investment. To allow you to learn about Keith's profitable project process in detail, he's kindly providing listeners of this podcast with free access to his LinkedIn learning course on ensuring ROI. All you have to do is follow Keith McCormick on LinkedIn and follow the special hashtag SDSKeith. The link gives you temporary course access, but with plenty of time to finish it. Getting a profitable return on your AI projects is the very definition of success. Check out the hashtag SDSKeith on LinkedIn to get started right away. Um, so that was a great yeah, introduction to APIs. Um, and, and then, yeah, so all together, the kinds of data engineering um, tool areas, this kind of the specializations that a data engineer needs to have related to relational databases, APIs, uh, including use and creation of APIs, ETL tools, data streaming tools like Kafka you mentioned, and data monitoring, really important as well. What is this? I hear a lot about Kafka. It seems like a very popular tool. What is data streaming? Like, how is... Like, what is what does that really mean? It's like I had this idea in my head. You're like, okay, well, it's this, it's data that's constantly flowing in a stream. But how is this when you're talking about data streaming? How is that different from other kinds of data flows? Or is mm -hmm. it something to do with the volume of it or the speed? 
No, it's when you think of how data has been processed for a long, long time, it's been processed in a way of jobs where you had, you created some kind of transformation or some kind of processing and then you schedule that processing. Okay, this is going to run once every minute, once every hour or every two hours or once a day it does a backup job and, and stuff. So that was what you had for a long, long time. And where, what tools like Kafka or uh, Kinesis on AWS or uh, Event Hub on, on Azure are bringing you is that you are starting to get event driven. So that means once something comes in, once an event gets fired off or sent off to your platform, the system automatically is going to react to that event and is going to basically feed that through your whole pipeline. So there is no scheduling. Whenever something new comes in, it's going to go through the whole thing and that's it. And that is a, for me, that was a, a big shift to actually understand that, that is a very strong concept, a very powerful concept. It's not as simple because it's usually a bit difficult to debug. With a simple job, you can schedule that and like very easily run logs. But if something is constantly and, and very fast and there's a lot of data, it's it's getting difficult. It's also another thing is that people tend to go for streaming when they don't need it just because mm. it's cool. Yeah, we have streaming, but right. that's on another. Yeah, good. dig into that a little bit more. What what are the kinds of circumstances where so there's just you know not enough data? It's like there's a there's a there's a hassle. There's an overhead associated with getting a data streaming system set up. Yeah. Uh, but then if there's not a lot of data flowing through, it's that that all of that overhead was was wasted. Yeah, ex exactly. That's the thing. People set up these these streaming systems because they they think it's cool. Maybe uh, they want to communicate something to the management that they have something new. But when you look at the consumer then, how is the consumer reacting? Uh, that might not be a live dashboard or something that needs really reacting in, in seconds. Maybe they run a report once a day or, and then, or once an hour. Let's let it be once an hour mm -hmm. where if you simply create a job for it, it's the same thing. But on the other side, they create the streaming pipelines, they set up the, the tools, they set up the monitoring for it. And because you bring in a, a message queue like Kafka, you then need also a processing tool that mm. can process the data. And so it, it gets more complicated, although you don't need it. Which should be the job for a data engineer, right? Say, oh, right. listen, we don't need this. Don't do this. Keep it as simple as possible. Let's stick with a with a simple job for now. If this, if we see from the scaling, it doesn't going to not going to work in half a year, then let's figure out a solution for that later. So, cool. Yeah. So it's starting to become very clear from everything that you've been saying about data engineering that it is kind of like plumbing of data science. So you, <laughs> your podcast is called Plumbers of Data Science, and from everything that you've described so far. Um, including things like the Kafka stream you've been talking about just now, you know, and imagining these data flows, uh, the plumber of data science, the data engineer is, uh, yes, building these pipes. And um, many of the pipes are doing processing or cleaning. Uh, there's uh, metrics reporting, monitoring happening on these pipelines to ensure that they're healthy, the right data are flowing through uh, and good quality. Um, yeah, is there anything else that you'd like to say about that name, Plumbers of Data Science, or no, anything for, about your show you'd like to talk about? When I when I created this, I don't. I, I would need to look it up. When I, it's ye years ago, um, I just felt like this is the this is the plumbing because it's super important. Nobody sees it. It's usually super underrated. Eh, we don't need this, but it's like little plumbing. It's a huge mess if you do it wrong or something messes up. Right, so that's how I how I got to that name. I actually started this just out of out of fun because I was bored driving for work every day, and like it was twenty <laughs> minutes to work and back, and uh, and so and so forty minutes, and I just got a recorder and I just recorded in the car. 
You're the recording audio. in the car? Yeah, I was just recording my thoughts while driving home. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. I've never heard of a show like that. I thought you were going a completely different way. You were like, oh, I have this 20 minutes uh, in the car, and I was looking for a good data engineering podcast, and nothing existed, so no. I made one. Yeah, but no, I, you're, they're just the, using the commute. There, there, <laughs> there, was, the there, was, uh, there was also, I don't think, a really good podcast about it. But like I was, I had a lot of stuff in my mind that I that I saw that is missing, mm -hmm. and so I just okay now this today I thought a lot about uh, key value stores. Then okay let's let's just chat about it and what I thought about it and that's how that's how they started. And then I started the YouTube channel and then do you do, you do the YouTube channel while you're driving? No, <laughs> <laughs> no that that is. That's the, usually this setup here where I do, most of the time I do live streams, helping people, doing Q&As. Sometimes I do a debugging session if I have a problem or um, last week we were analyzing, basically I was analyzing, but the viewers asked questions then, I was analyzing platforms. AWS has a nice YouTube channel, um, My Architecture. Mm. And so I'm spinning up a video and going through the video and my thoughts and oh. we were people have questions why did they do that why did they do that and then we try to come up uh i'm trying to tell them what I, what my thoughts are and why they might have done this and it's it's really fun do you know who mr beast is yes <laughs> <laughs> why? So he's like the most like successful youtuber of all time he recently valued his he wants to sell parts of his company or raise funds or something. He was valuing his company at $1.5 billion. Uh, you reacting to those videos, it reminds me of how he has this separate channel, Mr. Beast Reacts. <laughs> uh, so it's like I'm Andreas sure. Kretz reacts to, yeah. <laughs> to, to AWS engineering Maybe videos. I should bring up that, that channel, <laughs> Data <laughs> Engineer Reacts or something. Hey, let me write that down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. You, um, heard it, you heard it here first on Super Data Science. I uh, actually before before we were chatting, I watched the video. Uh, I watched a Mr. Beast video, the one where he uh, uh, cured a thousand people that they could see again. The the newest mm -hmm. one. I was actually watching this before before wow. we met. I've never actually but, watched it. I, 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 I've uh, maybe I watched two three videos, but this. Yeah. The, I just I, I read about it, uh, and lots of people have said. So I know that he kind of targets or maybe not targets deliberately. I know he's very popular with younger people, but apparently his videos still appeal to anyone of any age. And yeah, yeah anyway. It, that's, that's for data engineering very difficult. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> data engineering for kids. It's, it's, a, it's a very tight niche. Um, yeah. But it's, well, it's... You've managed well, to make the most of it. Uh, yeah, it, it's... More than 10,000 subscribers on YouTube, more than 100,000 followers on LinkedIn. So a lot of the data engineers in the world yeah. are uh, following you. And for, I think it's also because this is so close to actually software engineering and the, the computer science that actually people who are, are bored with doing the software development day in and day out in Python or in Java or stuff, that they are looking for a, for a next step, which this can absolutely be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The same yeah, like cool... we talked before. Yeah, so yeah, exactly as you're saying, if somebody has this strong computer science background, but they're like, oh, man, these amazing things happening with ChatGPT, I want to learn more about AI, what's a way that like I can make a move in that direction be useful to machine learning and data engineering then pops up as a really obvious choice. Mm. But it's also the, the interesting part is, in my academy, I also have a lot of data analysts who want to make the next step mm. towards a role that is that is wider, not just sitting at and the end. More lucrative. I don't know if it's more lucrative. Well, it's, All yes. So it data might engineering be. relative to data analyst, probably it, most of them. Yeah, it's a bit better paid, but it's not as, as well paid as data scientists or, or other roles. It's, uh, for me, it's, it, it's a passion. So if I, even if I would make more money as a scientist, I would never want to go into science. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I always said that. Um, but there are a lot of people coming actually from the outside, from, from a non-strictly computer science field, 
and they know, okay, I need to at least work that I that I understand how to code in Python, mm -hmm. that I know how to work with SQL. A lot of people do that as, a, as an analyst, for instance. But these are the two things, and if you know that, you can start. Then you can learn. But these are the basics. I also have that in my academy where I say people know it. if you don't know how to code, it's going to be very rough. Right. But there are a lot of people who actually go through this. Yes, it's like everything where you learn, it's not easy. But people make a good career out of it. Mm -hmm. So One thing I, I, I wrote down, I'm sorry, one thing, because I, yeah. I don't want to forget it again. Um, when we were talking about ML engineer and so on, it sounded a bit that the data engineer does not need to know about machine learning. Mm. But what I, from my experience, working as an engineer, working as a team lead for, for a data lab, the engineer should know at least the basics. Like how does, how does the actual machine learning process work, right? That first you have the training phase where you need to make a lot of data accessible. And then later you have your, your application phase where the model is or the, yeah, the model is learned, is trained, and you the data is coming in maybe as a stream, and then you apply the new data to your to your model and that creates outputs which go somewhere. I think that is something every engineer needs to needs to know, needs to understand to be able to actually work together with scientists and understand the language a bit, what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Shashank Kalanathi, uh, who is in episode number 623, he made the argument that um, the best data engineers that he knows are people who were previously data analysts because they have this understanding of what the downstream user of these data pipelines is going to be interested in. So I think that kind of ties into what you're saying here, that uh, if you don't know how the data are going to be used in a data science model, then you might you, there could be some easy opportunities that you're missing in the way that you create your pipelines. Yeah. That, like with a lot of jobs, it comes down to communication. And if yes, you can be maybe the we were talking about junior roles, they are maybe a bit more uh, more narrow from the understanding of the whole process. Mm -hmm. But as a data engineer, you should understand. Okay, or very often you I would say you need to understand what's the what's the goal, mm -hmm. what are people doing with it. And yeah, as a as an analyst, you have that. Mm -hmm that uh, for you. All right. So now we've been talking about lots of ways that you can end up in a data engineering career, but Andreas, <laughs> one of your most popular videos on YouTube of all time is called the right path to becoming a data engineer. So Andreas, what is that one and only path? <laughs> what is the right one? Well, um, there are, there are actually multiple paths when you think of tools, mm -hmm. right? You, might be on on AWS, you might be on Azure, or there might be some specific tools that companies need. But in generally, if in general, if you understand the the process, and I think we were already we were already hinting to that, that if you understand how is a platform usually structured and what kind of tasks you need to do with what kind of tools you need to work, then that's where where you know or where you know which what to learn and how to get to it. That you understand, okay, there is there are there are two layers. There's your transactional layer, and there's your your analytical layer, or yeah, where you most likely on the top you most find most likely find some uh, transactional databases, and on the bottom in the analytical layer is usually where you have your data warehouses and stuff. That you understand that, and that you know the difference between these tools, and again from the left. Uh, I talked in the earlier left where the data originates, right where the data is used, that you understand, okay, there is some there is an integration phase. The data is coming in. Somehow it needs to be integrated. There are tools available. Learn one of them. Most of the time, that's the 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 how to do it is is very very uh, or is the same than in a lot of other tools. Then it comes in. You maybe have something like a message queue, then you have a processing framework, and then you have a storage layer and a visualization or a connect layer. 
on the other side. And then pick out from these layers, pick out specific tools. Maybe if you want to go on, on AWS or if you want to be on Azure, then you would select the fitting tools for these, for these platforms. Or if you want to stay open source, okay, then you might use for an API, you might use Fast API or Postgres for the database before that. Then you would get into Kafka and Spark for uh, a message queue and a processing framework. And on top, you might sit a MongoDB. Right? So th this way, you already have, have a lot of these topics uh, fitted. And then you, you could even say, okay, let's do a visualization. Let's, let's play around with uh, Power BI and see how then Power BI would actually connect to that data or, or a dashboard would connect to the data and how this would, would get shown. And then you, you have these, these important areas covered. From there, you can then say, okay, I know I understand how that works. Let's see how another tool works. Let's see maybe how, how this all works on AWS. And then, yeah, go from there. Cool. That was a because, great explanation. Yeah. Uh, because, because you don't, that's, that's also something... That something that a lot of people do wrong. They see all these tools out there and they think they need to learn everything mm. to become a good data engineer. No, no, you need to understand, okay, what are the, what's the usual template? How is it this is usually going to work? And then once you, see, once you know this, you see this everywhere. It's... Uh, so in that explanation, you mentioned lots of different tools like FastAPI, MongoDB, and some others that we talked about earlier, like Kafka. What are your favorite data engineering tools? Or maybe an even more interesting question. What are the tools that you think our listeners should be checking out that maybe aren't obvious? <laughs> maybe that hmm, maybe aren't obvious is actually hmm, that's that's difficult because like you're some, getting very up and coming you, or you, that you're, you're getting about. very quickly into the into the uh, niche market. Hmm. So especially if you want to learn, if you want to apply, I would start looking into the into the bigger platforms. Right. I'm like, I'm an AWS guy, so I, I'm I would go towards AWS. It's also the platform that is used the most out there. But lately, uh, because I back in my old work, I was working a lot with Spark. And I, I did trainings for, uh, in my academy, I have trainings for Snowflake and for Databricks. And these two are, you can all, can you call them upcoming? I mean, they're already there. Right. They're, they're everywhere. They're everywhere for a reason. You see them on LinkedIn uh, and, and on YouTube, in YouTube videos for a reason, because they are so strong and they give you these, these options that weren't there before in a, What's in a very... Tight package. What's up with the DBT? We're seeing that a lot lately. DBT yeah. seems to be like they're they're kind of like joining in a way. It seems to me like the way the Snowflake and Databricks seem to have become ubiquitous. I'm hearing, I'm hearing DBT more and, more and more. Well, DBT is uh, actually we're preparing right now something for the academy with DBT oh, there you go. because <laughs> it's so popular. <laughs> yeah. um, the thing is with DBT, you. Or let, let's say from the other side, you have your data, let's say in a, in a data warehouse, it might, it might be in Snowflake. And you want to start transforming that data, not directly in, uh, in Snowflake so that you say, okay, I want to create code in Snowflake and then do everything there, but have something from the outside that actually then executes the the statements within your platform does the transformation like triggers the the transformation within snowflake and then snowflake does the rest or in that you don't need to write um spark code in databricks but actually you write your statements in in dbt and that does then the whole processing or kicks off the processing in in, in databricks where you of course have that upside you don't need to learn um spark Python, PySpark for it. So I think that's that's where this coming coming from. That's coming a lot also from the analyst, right? Because now there are these tools and you want to make them as easily accessible to analysts, to scientists. 
And that's where tools like DBT are coming in and are very strong. So it's like an abstraction layer on top of a data warehouse that allows you to kind of have this standardized syntax for doing work across lots of different data warehouse types. I I would, yeah, I would, you could call it that. Yeah, it's like, yeah, an abstraction layer again. In recent conversation, you've mentioned things like AWS being the cloud platform that you use the most. The other big ones out there are Azure, GCP. Is there any reason why a data engineer should choose one or the other? I guess if they're getting started, AWS might be the most obvious choice since it's the most broadly applicable. Um, yeah, maybe just give us some context on your thoughts about these different cloud platforms. You know, should people be getting certificates in any of them or all of them? Mm -hmm. So yes, you could say, or you can say that AWS is the one that is most used out there. So it's fair, it's a fairly safe bet to go with AWS. On the other hand, it's GCP or Azure are the same, same safe bets, because once you understand how it works on GCP, you are going to know how to get into AWS, for instance. How I did that with my students before is, I'm telling them, do some research because it's not always that AWS is the one to go for. Like for instance, I had a, a student from Scandinavia and he, then he did research and he actually found out the industries that he want to go into and actually in Scandinavia, they are using Azure the most. So mm -hmm. then he started actually targeting Azure. It's also very often if you go into larger companies, into, into large corporations, they might be interested in Azure because they're already in the Microsoft ecosystem. They already have their office, they have their SharePoint and, and everything. And it's, it's, for them, it's very tightly knit in and, and the, with, with single sign-on and everything. So it depends a bit on where you want to go. If you're in the startup sector, if you're... Yeah, then you most likely want to look at at AWS or maybe at GCP, but the larger companies, yeah. So that's like that's Azure, one yeah. thing. It's not it's not as easy that you say okay, go with AWS and that's it. <laughs> it, it needs a bit of research and um, yeah, certificates. I actually did a poll on LinkedIn a few weeks back. Let me quickly remember. I, it. it I asked what, why, why should you do certifications for, for the job or for getting a job, for actually learning and something else. And the interesting part was, people were the most people actually said for learning, for education, because you, you train yourself up to that certification, and then you have a very specific knowledge or a proven knowledge in these these areas. So that's that's where you, people use certifications the most. Of course, there are some companies that need a certification for Azure. If you're doing client work and you need to, you're you're like charging a lot, and maybe you you actually need to have people certified. But it's yeah, it's more people tend to see this more as an educational tool. Cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, nice. So we now have a great sense of what data engineering is and what the favorite tools are and how we can be doing it in cloud platforms. Where do you think the future of data engineering is going, Andreas? So our data set size is going to get smaller. No. <laughs> <laughs> and there are also going to be more uses of data. So it's here to stay. It might change here and there a bit. As you said, there's also ML engineers and there, uh, there's this work towards um, taking care of data that is in the data warehouse. Um, some, some people call this analytics engineer. So that's, that's where the data engineer is moving. It's data engineer is moving more towards what I mentioned before, the right side towards the, the uh, destination or the, the consumers. But it's also on the on the left side of the data integration. That's where a lot of stuff is changing right now. 
where you have tools that actually um, make it very easy to ingest data from sources so you don't, as an engineer, you don't have to configure something and then figure something out for the 20th time to integrate a simple database or simple API. And that's this kind of automation, this kind of, of helper work. That's what's coming in the next years as well. So these nice. two areas, I think that they're very important. I like that. Analytics engineer is not a specific career term that I've heard before, but makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it, it's, I'm always a bit cautious with, with career names, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it, there's a lot of uh, shift or, or moving right now, but that's the the general area where where we as an as engineers need to be a bit more more into. In a recent episode, number six fifty three, with Carlos Aguilar, he described effectively that role. I think he was kind of doing for many years. He was at a uh, cancer data startup, managing the data insights engineering team. And I mm -hmm. think this sounds very similar to analytics engineering. Um, it, it, yeah, so maybe that's kind of like another way of describing it, data insights engineering. It's like, oh, yeah, on the, the far right of your pipeline, um, yeah, helping yeah. with getting the, the data be easily digestible, analyzable. Yeah, absolutely. That, makes, that sounds like it. Because <clears throat> it's, we're, we're already behind the stage or after that stage where as an engineer, you say, okay, I'm going to take the data, I'm going to do some processing to the transformation, and I'm going to drop it into a staging table, and then somebody else is going to do that. Okay, I'm job done, next. And I think that's that's where we're past. Uh, we need to move towards that modeling the data in the warehouse or in the destination and helping actually um, then make or making it easy to, to process or to use in that, that later stage. Nice. Yeah. And you mentioned the past there. Let's go into your past a little bit, Andreas. So uh, before your career as an educator, you worked as a data engineer um, and at well-known German companies like Bosch. And so what can you tell us about your early career, maybe some challenges uh, that you encountered or aspirations you have? And in particular, I'm interested in what prompted you to transition to running your Learn Data Engineering Academy full time. Mm -hmm. So, I'm. Th this history actually leads a bit into how I got into engineering because I didn't, I didn't choy or I didn't start out to okay, I want to become a data engineer. I actually was working on a project where a lot of machine data is was coming in, and the problem was with the tools that I learned back at university and before, I actually, it, it w I couldn't process them. It was very clear that once this goes live, this, nothing's going to work. Everything's going to break down. And then there was starting uh, to actually look at what are the alternatives and big data was the big thing back then. And that's how I stumbled into that role of a data engineer. Okay, let's figure out a solution for this. Which type of tools can we actually use there? Uh, what are the upsides of, of the NoSQL databases? How can we actually manage that? Because a lot of uh, machine learning was also uh, within that project or was, was part of that goal of that project. How can we incorporate that? How can, can we make this data useful? And that's how I, how I got into that and how I started with this. And from there, stuff grew and did a lot of things. Then was the team lead of a of an engineering team, and then had for some time uh, under me the the data lab with data scientists as well. But throughout the, I think before I one and a half years before I jumped off, I actually was already teaching people through my academy. It, it wasn't mm -hmm. called Learn Data Engineering back then, but I was I was doing coaching. I, help people become data engineers. And uh, yeah, when COVID hit, I, I started on the side with my additional time that I had because I didn't need to travel, start the academy. And uh, yeah, for me, the, the actual, I, I like the coaching, I like the teaching, I like recording stuff for people that actually help them. And, and then I made the jump. It wasn't like, 
um, it, it, it wasn't a big a big decision or uh, it, it wasn't a very difficult decision for me because I how the the years before that I always had uh, health problems because I usually don't talk about this but uh, I have this um, this chronic disease um, you maybe know this it's uh, it's called colitis there's colitis and there's Crohn's which which are uh, mm. these how are they called um, yeah it's my I have the same name Crohn's disease okay that's the so that's yeah it's like the yeah. So that's when people like, or how do I pronounce your name? Well, I say, you know, <laughs> like colitis. <laughs> yeah. So that's basically, and I always had, I, I, it was getting worse and worse. And so I was saying, I said, okay, I need to, I need to do something. And then I, I was fortunate enough that my employer said, okay, then let's try to get you healthy again. Let's, you can do a year of sabbatical. and see what you want to do then after that and i actually i i saw i worked on the academy had fun teaching people and this led somehow into okay i want to do this full time i want to help people it feels good it feels right and that's how i made this transition and i i don't regret it it's it's a it's a yeah. great job of actually um being able to help people and getting the feedback andreas I made that switch to data engineer or I, I had a, a student in the coaching who was actually a data scientist who had problems with the, with the, with the engineering at work. So we figured that out back then. So that was that I love that kind of work. The learn data Academy is doing exceptionally well and yeah, your audience is enormous and growing quickly. So yeah, it does really seem to me, Andreas, like the right fit as well. All right, so Andreas, we've learned a lot from you today as we reach the end of an episode. I always ask our guests for a book recommendation. Do you have one for us? I actually have one. Um, that's Zero to One from Peter Thiel. Mm -hmm. um, and we, yeah, I actually, I have that here. So we were, we were talking about that before. <laughs> um, because the title that was something that was very influential for me um i actually I, I read that years back i i can't even remember exactly what was in that book but the back in the day i was i was working basically on innovation i was working on from zero to one which that is something that a lot of people need to need to understand that's a that's a big step and I, I did that with my academy that was first there was no academy and then i figured out what could i do how could i structure this for people to actually learn this how could i structure this for beginners for scientists for analysts and so on and that that process is is very very important and that's why i like this book and especially the title because people should try to incorporate that into their into their life if it's if it's work if it's private like do something, something new. Try to come up with something um, that is that is innovative. And that's yeah, that's what a lot of people within companies think they're doing. They might not be doing. And because of that, you you that idea zero to one. Am I really doing zero to one, or am I am I just doing another iteration? Mm -hmm. So that's that's something I highly recommend to read. It's a great book. I liked it a lot. It's been many years since I've read it as well, but it's uh, it's content rich. A lot of nonfiction works have a lot of fluff. <laughs> I actually, I'm, I'm I'm going to doesn't. keep that here. I'm going to read that again. So nice. <laughs> maybe maybe I I learned something new. I bet again. Yeah, completely new perspective. I imagine many years later. Yeah uh yeah um well andreas clearly a lot of wonderful insights can be gleaned from you uh we would love to know how we can be following you after the show to get more of your insights going forward you find me the, the biggest platform where i'm the most is linkedin mm -hmm. that's where you find me the most uh, also you can comment under one of my youtube videos i always answer the comments 
Yeah, I have an Instagram. That's also something I started. I started an Instagram, Learn Data Engineering Instagram, where I'm posting. I'm usually doing Q and A's there, where I just I post, ask me a question, and then people are I have very very interesting questions, and uh, I'm getting back to them and helping them. I think that has over ten thousand followers now. So yes, you do. Uh, yeah, these three things that are the the platforms where I'm at the most. Cool. All right, Andreas. Well, thank you very much for joining me on the show. It's <laughs> incredible to have somebody that uh, Kate knows so well. And for so many years, I can't believe that we hadn't had a conversation earlier. It's been great to get to know you on air, and I look forward to doing it again in the future. Yeah, thanks. It was really a great time talking to you. And yeah, thanks for having me on. I hope you loved today's deep dive into data engineering with the leading data engineering educator, Andreas Kretz. In today's episode, Andreas filled us in on how data scientists depend on data engineers for their model training data, while data analysts depend on data engineers producing clean structured data for them to work with. He talked about how data engineers are closer to computer science while data scientists are closer to math and statistics, how data scientists can become more capable and independent by developing data engineering skills, such as expertise with relational databases, the use and creation of APIs, ETL tools, data streaming tools like Kafka, and data monitoring. And finally, Andreas told us about how Snowflake, Databricks, and DBT are becoming essential tools for data engineers to know. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Andreas's social media profiles, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 657. That's superdatascience.com slash 657. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on the Super Data Science YouTube channel. And of course, subscribe if you haven't already. I also encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by following me on LinkedIn or Twitter and then tagging me in a post about it. Your feedback is invaluable for helping us shape future episodes of the show. Thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science podcast episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana, Mario, Natalie, Serge, Sylvia, Zara, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for producing another excellent episode for us today. For enabling that super team to create this free podcast for you, we are deeply grateful to our sponsors whom I've hand-selected as partners because I expect their products to be genuinely of interest to you. Please consider supporting this free show by checking out our sponsors' links, which you can find in the show notes. And if you yourself are interested in sponsoring an episode, you can get the details on how by making your way to johncrone.com slash podcast. All right, and thanks of course to you for listening. It's literally why I'm here. Until next time, my friend, keep on rocking it out there, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.